Hello and a very warm welcome to this video. Thank you very much for joining it. Verus Books are launching their fabulous new series of Edward de Vere plays in hardback. Let us all get behind this project and support it. It is a wonderful thing to own a set oneself. Wonderful thing also to give it to people. Baptisms, bar mitzvahs, birthdays, Christmas, they're all round the corner the whole time. Whether you want to give them to people you love or people you may even wish to irritate then let us do that. Amazon is behaving a little bit peculiarly over the ascription to Edward de Vere. Don't worry about it. You can buy them on Amazon, but they are tricky. If you have difficulty there, you can get the books directly from verusbooks.com. This particular edition of Hamlet uh, has written in it, this book is dedicated to Alexander Waugh, whose passionate scholarship inspired this series. I can't tell you how happy, proud and gratified I am by that uh, dedication. I don't think there are many people who can say that they've had Hamlet dedicated to them. The previous honour of this sort, which I had, was uh, the last book of Evelyn Waugh, Little Learning, but I have to say that this absolutely caps that and I'm much more excited by this dedication than any other dedication I could conceive. I haven't even met the people behind Verus Publishing, so it's a lovely thing to think that these videos that you're watching are having some influence around the world, and that we have out there a great team of people who are all dedicated to preserving the truth of the authorship of Shakespeare's plays. Now, let us get on with the show. I want to talk today about this man, Davis of Hereford. He was a calligrapher and a writing master and a prolific poet. Not really known today, but he was well known from the many editions of his works that he produced in his lifetime. We're going to look at an epigram that he wrote. I've called this particular episode John Davis of Hereford New, and many of you all know why, because it's part of a great series, an ongoing series, all of these titles are currently available on this channel. Please explore them. Is it possible that some of your attention has gone because you've been looking at the engraving on the right? Rather a peculiar image of Father Time who has put down his sickle and his hourglass in order to raise up the naked ass of the figure of folly so that it can be whipped with greater efficacy by the figure of wit. Well, this is the title page of Davis of Hereford's book, which we're going to look into, and it is called The Scourge of Folly, consisting of satirical epigrams. And believe it or not, the epigram about Shakespeare comes among those satirical epigrams, not in the later section in which it says, and others in honour of many noble and worthy persons. So we're going to look at that satirical epigram and see how it scourges folly. It is numbered epigram 159 and is entitled To Our English Terence, Master Will Shake Hyphen Spear. Now, many of you will be aware that this Shake Hyphen Spear was not a form of orthography that was used by William Shakespeare of Stratford. He never put a hyphen in his name at any time. And of course, Will Shake Hyphen Spear is an allusion to the patron goddess of playwrights and poetic eloquence, Pallas, whose will at Ilium shook the spear of Achilles, enabling him to slay Hector. So very obviously will, shake hyphen spear is a pseudonym. This book has 292 epigrams in it, and only three of them are dedicated to anyone with a hyphen in their name. Number 159, to shake hyphen spear. And number 160, to no hyphen body. And number 161, to some hyphen body. This is telling us that these three epigrams are connected. It has always been my view that when reading epigrams of this period, you must read what is written to either side of them because they very often enable you to a greater understanding of the text you're interested in. In fact, in this particular case, if you look at the epigram just before the one about a will shake hyphen spear, you see, were I Arthur, in other words, king, were I king, thou my knight shouldst be, and at my table round should have a place. Well, the knights of the round table were known as companions, comes from the Latin 
cum panis, with bread. They were breaking bread with the king, and thus they were uh, companions of the king. Uh, but, sith that cannot be, this may and can, play thou the king of hearts. Well, this is very obviously connected to what is said about Shakespeare, just a few lines below. Hadst thou not played some kingly parts in sport, thou hadst been a companion for a king. So I am going to show towards the end of this presentation how uh, these four epigrams interconnect. But let us start with the one about Shakespeare himself to our English Terence Master Will Shake hyphen Spear. This has caused no end of problems to traditional Stratfordian scholars. They cannot make any sense of it at all. E.K. Chambers, one of the great Shakespearean scholars of the 20th century, simply called it cryptic, cryptic meaning hidden or secret. And of course, the great impediment for traditional scholars is they don't actually know who. Shakespeare is. They conceive him to be a grain merchant from the British Midlands with no record of education, etc. So it does make it very, very hard for them indeed to understand what is being said about Shakespeare at the time. What does our greatest living Shakespearean scholar have to say about it? This, of course, is Sir Professor Stanley Wells. Arise, Sir Stanley. You can see a rather mournful face on Prince Charles as he knights him, he'd far rather be knighting uh, Sir Mark Rylance, Sir Derek Jacobi, what have you, because Prince Charles himself um, is not at all comfortable with the traditional identification of William Shakespeare as the merchant from Stratford. He wrote a letter to Professor Sir Jonathan Bates saying, could you give me ten good reasons why I should believe this nonsense, and Jonathan Bate did his best to write back, but of course none of his reasons holds any water whatsoever. And Prince Charles's father, uh, Prince Philip, also a known authorship sceptic. So a sad time for Prince Charles to be knighting Stanley Wells, but very, very nice for Stanley Wells to be called Sir Stanley Wells. So what does Sir Stanley Wells have to say about this particular epigram? Does he understand it? He calls this epigram somewhat obscure in its elusiveness, but certainly names him as an actor, and in its title compares him to one of the greatest Roman playwrights. You see how baffled these Stratfordian scholars are when it comes to things like this. Somewhat obscure in its elusiveness. So in other words, he can't understand it at all, but he holds on to the two things which he thinks are certain, that it names him as an actor, and in its title compares him to one of the greatest Roman playwrights. Well, we're going to test the certainty of the former in just a moment. Uh, let's just have a quick look at the comparison to the Roman playwright. Indeed, it is called To Our English Terence, and it is fair to say that Terence was one of the greatest Roman playwrights. But was he the Roman playwright that one would traditionally associate with Shakespeare? Shakespeare, of course, wrote many tragedies, and Terence didn't write a single tragedy. Shakespeare, of course, wrote many histories, and Terence didn't write a single history. Uh, Shakespeare wrote many comedies. Ah, at last, Terence was indeed a comic playwright. So that's good. But was he the best comic playwright? Was he even the Roman playwright with whom Shakespeare most identified? No, he wasn't. The playwright who is considered the greatest of the comic Roman playwrights was Plautus, so why not say to our English Plautus? And indeed, Shakespeare based a whole play, The Comedy of Errors, on a play by Plautus and seems to have very little connection with Terence. So why does Davis of Hereford choose to our English Terence master will shake hyphen spear? Actually, the answer is given away in a near contemporary picture of Terence. Here you see two African servants holding up an ancient Roman mirror. Ancient Roman mirrors did look rather like that. There's an there's a actual picture of one. On the mirror seems to be reflected the image of Publius Terentius Affair, the so-called playwright looking like a Roman nobleman. Actually, if you look very closely at those African servants, you'll see they're not African servants at all. They are wearing African masks, and behind those masks you can see they both have blonde hair, and if you look at their hands they have pale skin. So they are masked as African servants, while Terence is looking, as I say, like a Roman nobleman, 
but Terence was, in fact, an African servant, so it is all the wrong way around. So who are these two blonde-haired people behind the African servants' masks? Well, they are patently Scipio and Laelius, two noblemen who wrote plays and put them under the name of Terence. This is well documented by contemporary writers Cicero, Quintilian, Suetonius writes about it, the Roman scholar Santra writes about it, and there's a hint of it even in Terence's own testimony that the plays were in fact by these two noblemen. In the time of Shakespeare, 1570, this very famous book was published called The Schoolmaster by Roger Ascombe, and in this book he talks about this exact issue. It is well known by good record of learning and that by Cicero's own witness that some comedies bearing Terence's name were written by worthy Scipio and wise Laelius, and therefore as oft as I read those comedies so oft a sound in my ear the pure fine talk of Rome which was used by the flower of the worthiest nobility that ever Rome bred. The famous essayist Montaigne called this cover-up a kind of mockery and injury, so it was very well known uh, to the people of the 16th century. And this, of course, is why uh, John Davis of Hereford calls Will Shake Hyphen Spear our English Terence, because as Davis of Hereford read Shakespeare, so oft did sound in his ears the pure fine talk of England, which was used by the flower of the worthiest nobility that ever England bred. Now, we're going to have a look at this poem, which divides very neatly into two sections of four lines each. Some say, good will, which I in sport do sing, hadst thou not played some kingly parts in sport, thou hadst been a companion for a king, and been a king among the meaner sort. Well, on one level, that seems fairly straightforward, but it is full of little catches for the unwary particularly people like Professor Sir Stanley Wells, who bases his certainty on the idea that this is telling us that William Shakespeare was an actor. On the second line, hadst thou not played some kingly parts in sport? Well, is he right to be certain about this, or is the poet using something called metaphor? If you look in the line just above, Davis of Hereford talks of himself, which I in sport do sing. Does this mean to Stanley Wells that he certainly identifies himself as a singer? Or in two lines above, where Davis of Hereford writes, I'll play thy man. Does this mean that Davis of Hereford certainly identifies himself as one who is about to become an actor or a player? In 1594, the work called Willoughby, his avisa, we hear, and shake hyphen spear, paints poor Lucrece rape. Does this certainly identify Sheikh Hyphen Spear as a painter, indeed one who worked on a canvas of Lucrece being raped? I think not. I think we're dealing here with metaphor. As we've seen, the poem is entitled To Our English Terence. Terence was a playwright. He was not an actor. Why would Davis of Hereford title his poem like this? only to bang on about an actor. Hadst thou not played some kingly parts in sport? Another huge problem for the Stratfordianists who say that William Shakespeare was a professional actor. Why, if he's a professional, is he acting some kingly parts in sport? Well, they're not looking out for the metaphor, as I say. If you look in the line above, we have the same, in sport. What Davis of Hereford is trying to tell his readers is that there is something in common in the first line which described his writing, using the metaphor to sing, and the writing of Shakespeare in the second line, using the metaphor to play. So some say goodwill, obviously referring to will shake hyphen spear, but it has a double meaning too, because a goodwill also means friendly, helpful, cooperative feeling. And in another poem, Davis of Hereford writes to William Earl of Pembroke and he uses good will, written just like this, with a gap between the two, twice, and in each way it has a different meaning. The first means good will, i.e. William, and the second means good will, friendly, helpful, cooperative feeling. So we know that's what Davis of Hereford does, and so we should be able to interpret this good will in both ways. Um, which I in sport do sing, hadst thou not played some kingly parts in sport, thou hadst been a companion for a king. Oh dear, another crashing problem for the Stratfordianists. 
a William Shakespeare of Stratford could never, ever, ever have been a companion for a king. As I've said, a companion is the highest order of knighthood. Interesting, of course, that the companions of the Garter, the very highest order, twice voted unanimously for the Earl of Oxford to be a fellow companion of the Garter, and Queen Elizabeth turned him down. So one does wonder whether that was not connected to what is being written here. Was she irritated by Oxford for writing some kingly parts in sport? Let us not forget that Queen Elizabeth said, Know ye not that I am Richard II? Did this not irritate her somewhat uh, that Oxford had written these parts and therefore she declined to allow him to be a companion of the garter. Certainly makes a lot more sense for the Oxfordian thesis than anything than the Stratfordians have come up to explain. So he would have been a companion for a king and been a king among the meaner sort. Meaner sort is a common phrase at the time, meaning of the lower classes, the lower orders, and specifically can mean actors. I think that's what it is meaning here, or the people of the theatre, the theatre types. Again, problem for Stanley Wells. Why is it that if his professional actor had not acted a part of a king, that he could have been a king amongst the theatre folk? Again, for Oxford, it makes total sense. Oxford was the most influential person in the theatre in the 1580s. Indeed, you could have then described him as a king among the meaner sort. But all these incredible influences, his patronage of the dramatists and the players of the theatres, um, his own writing and his own acting, etc., etc., all came to a mysterious end at the beginning of the 1590s. And we don't really know why. A lot of Oxfordians will say, well, it happened simply because he ran out of money. But maybe this poem by Davis of Hereford is telling us something else, that maybe he did offend the Queen in some way. And that is why he was no longer a king among the meaner sort. So to paraphrase those first four lines in modern English prose, some say, which I repeat in friendly tone, that had you not portrayed some kings disrespectfully in your plays, you would have been a companion for a king and a king among the players too. Let us move on then to the second half. Some others rail, but rail as they think fit. Thou hast no railing but a reigning wit, and honesty thou sowst, which they do reap, so to increase their stock, which they do keep. Again, it's not difficult, particularly if you're applying it to the Oxfordian thesis. It has many catches for the Stratfordianist. But Davis of Hereford is always trying to help his readers out. Thou hast no railing, R-A-Y, very deliberately spelt differently from rail, which is twice written in the previous line, R-A-I. Davis of Hereford is trying to help you to realise that railing in the second instance has a different meaning. Some others do rail, i.e. they abuse you, but rail as they think fit, let them do so. Thou hast no railing. A railing, of course, is a fence, a boundary, a limit, a constraint. Therefore, thou hast no limit, no constraint. You are essentially free. You have no railing but a reigning wit. And this is an illusion to one of the most famous poems of Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, called My Mind to Me, A Kingdom Is, Such Perfect Joy Therein I Find, That It Excels All Other Bliss That World Affords or Grows By Kind. This famous poem, which exists in a 1580s manuscript with the Earl of Oxford's name underneath it in the Harvard University, was circulated many times in this age and was extremely well known. And the whole point of the poem is Oxford is saying that he doesn't need all of the worries, the woes, uh, the riches, the needs that uh, kings are heir to, because his mind to him is a kingdom. He has therefore no boundaries. He is free. He has a reigning wit and honesty thou sowst, which they do reap, so to increase their stock, which they do keep. Stock and store were used synonymously in those days to increase their worth. So honesty uh, thou sowst, uh, you need to know what is meant by honesty. It doesn't mean that he gives the right change. If you look in the Oxford Dictionary of English, you'll find it also means generosity, liberality, 
hospitality, three things which we identify very, very much with the Earl of Oxford, not at all, of course, with William Shakespeare of Stratford. There's a nice quotation in the Oxford Dictionary dating from 1556, a man not only of great learning, but also of as great honesty in seeking to profit all men by his travail. This precisely describes the Earl of Oxford's activities, seeking to profit other men uh, by his great learning and his honesty. Indeed, the Earl of Oxford himself is quoted next door from Timon of Athens. A noble gentleman tis if he would not keep so good a house. Every man has his fault and honesty is his. The Timon of Athens, a very autobiographical play uh, describing all the bloodsuckers who came to take patronage of the Earl of Oxford. He eventually went bankrupt and they, having sucked up to him enormously, then turned rather against him when they realised he didn't have any money. That's what happens in Timon of Athens. That's what happens in Oxford's life. Many of his contemporaries left testimony to his extraordinary generosity. Robert Greene in 1584 wrote of him as one to whom all scholars flock. Angel Day in 1586 talks of his generous estate and surpassing bounty. To Thomas Nash he is an infinite Mycenas, that's an infinitely generous patron to learned men that not any that belong to them but have tasted of the cool streams of his liberality. Henry Lock worried of the over many greedy horse leeches which sucked too ravenously on his sweet liberality. And after Oxford's death, Gervais Markham wrote of his pietas, honestas, there you go, that's this honesty again, magnanimous, the infinite house he kept to feed all people and the bounty which religion and learning daily took from him are trumpets so loud that all ears know them. This is clearly what is being referred to by Davis of Hereford, and honesty thou sowest, which they do reap, so to increase their stock, which they do keep. But it's not just talking about financial help and generosity in that sense of patronage, it's talking about the kernel of Oxford's philosophy, which is the giving, the honesty, the liberality of mind, which improves other people, who can then feast upon it. I say this is Oxford's philosophy because it was, and it was published as his philosophy, so all men of the time knew about it. Here in this published poem, the Earl of Oxford to the reader, he starts, the labouring man that tills the fertile soil and reaps the harvest fruit hath not indeed the gain but pain, and if for all his toil he gets the straw, the Lord will have the seed. In other words, that the work that we do is all done of whatever class or type, wherever you fit in society, the work you do is for the benefit, for the gain of others to reap the advantage. He talks further down of the writer, so he that takes the pain to pen the book reaps not the gifts of goodly golden muse, but those gain that who on the work shall look. Again, it is the, the final product, the reader who makes the profit, who reaps the profit, this idea of reaping on the previous page. He talks, Oxford talks, to the translator of this book and says that you have been profited in the translating, so many may reap knowledge by the reading of the same that shall comfort the afflicted, confirm the doubtful, encourage the coward, and lift up the base-minded man. You can see that Davis of Hereford is referring to this published work of Oxford's when he talks about the honesty thou sowest, which they do reap, so to increase their stock, which they do keep. It's exactly what is being said by Oxford on the right here, and exactly the same philosophy that Oxford goes on about over the page when he asks what the point of your studies what do they avail if you do not participate them to others? No man is lord of anything, though in and of him there be much consisting, till he communicate his parts to others, as Edward de Vere writes in Troilus and Cressida, Act 3. What doth avail the tree unless it yield fruit unto another? What doth avail the vine unless another delighteth in the grape? What doth avail the rose unless another took pleasure in the smell, and so it is in all other things as well as in man. This is the 
as I say, the absolute kernel of Oxford's philosophy, which he puts into the his Shakespeare plays and which Davis of Hereford is referring to. In Measure for Measure, he writes, Thyself and thy belongings are not thine own so proper as to waste. Heaven doth with us as we with torches do, not light them for themselves, for if our virtues did not go forth of us, t'were all alike as if we had them not. This idea of being like a torch that gives its light for others. We see this on this wonderful title page of Minerva Britanna from 1612. You see the two candles on top left and top right with that almost invisible, deliberately so, Latin writing behind it. Ut alis me consumo. Likewise, do I consume myself for others. This book is Minerva Britanna, the British spear shaker, i.e. William Shakespeare. And you can see the picture at the bottom with the laurel wreath for the great poet and inside it the hidden hand of a playwright coming out, writing mente videbor, with the mind I shall be seen, when turned round and anagrammatised, Tibi nom de Vere, your name, British spear shaker, is de Vere, Tibi nom de Vere. I have made a presentation on this elsewhere called Henry Peacham New, and if you haven't seen it, do so. I go into it quite detailed. It is a phenomenal title page telling us, again, uh, Edward de Vere's whole philosophy, which he puts in to Shakespeare. In Edward III, we have uh, the king saying, what is that picture over there? And the response, a pelican, my lord, wounding her bosom with crooked beak, that so her nest of young ones might be fed with drops of blood that issue from her heart. The motto, sic et vos, and so should you. As I say, there is no more uh, obvious, uh, direct philosophy that the Earl of Oxford spreads through his life, through his work, and through his plays uh, than this, sic et vos, and so should you. Give your life for others, and honesty thou sowest, which they do reap, so to increase their stock, which they do keep, is entirely fitting of the Earl of Oxford and has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the grain merchant of Stratford-upon-Avon, who was not known for his generosity at all. In fact, in his will, he seems to give nothing to the poor, nothing to learning. He's very mean indeed to his own wife. The documents about him show that he was parsimonious in the extreme and constantly suing people for small amounts of money. And there is no corroborative record to suggest that he had a liberality of mind or a generosity of spirit in any sense whatsoever. So, if I were to paraphrase now in plain modern English the whole of this poem, some say, which I repeat in friendly tone, that had you not portrayed some kings disrespectfully in your plays, you would have been a companion for a king and a king among the players too. Others berate you, let them rail, for you are free with a reigning wit and a liberality which they can exploit for their own self-improvement and lasting benefit. Now, I've just highlighted for you there Two phrases, thou hast and thou sowst. I bring this up because they're in the present tense and a little group of people called anti-Oxfordians, desperate for the Earl of Oxford not to be shown to be Shakespeare, they say, well, this can't be about the Earl of Oxford because the Earl of Oxford died in 1604 and this poem wasn't written until at least uh, 1610 or wasn't published then. And he's being addressed in the present tense, thou hast, thou sowst. Well, this shows... A, an ignorance, I'm afraid to say, of how uh, contemporary poets at this time addressed other poets. And uh, we wouldn't say when Sir John Denham writes, Virgil, thou hast no wit, and Ovid is more short of will, that it can't be addressed to Virgil and Ovid, because Virgil and Ovid were dead when Sir John Denham wrote it. Likewise, in Love's Martyr, 1601, Away, fond rhyming Ovid, lest thou write of Progne's murder or Lucrece rape. Again, addressing Ovid directly in the present tense, Ovid, who died many years ago. In fact, you only have to look in this very same book of Davis of Hereford, and there you'll see an epigram written to the Earl of Essex, who died three years before the Earl of Oxford in 1601, and the poem admits that he's dead, and has the line, But noble Essex, now thy love so free, that thou dost pray for them that prey on thee. Again, addressing a dead man in the present tense. So I'm afraid that is a 
a, a non-argument uh, to say it cannot be addressed to the Earl of Oxford, who is dead. In fact, I would go so far as to say it has to be addressed to the Earl of Oxford, who is dead, and has to be about a previous monarch. You could not write an epigram in the reign of James I saying, ha, 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 James I was insulted by this living playwright, and so he didn't give him an honour and make him a companion. You'd be in terrible trouble for that. So clearly the king who took offence is a reference to the earlier monarch, Queen Elizabeth, and to the Earl of Oxford, who is dead. Right, I promised at the beginning of this presentation that I would show you how these four epigrams are actually connected. I think the best way into this is to look at the titles which Davis of Hereford gives to the sequence of his epigrams from 155 to 165. 155 to my worthily disposed friend Mr Samuel Daniel, 156 to my well-accomplished friend Mr Ben Johnson, 157 to my much-esteemed Inigo Jones, you get the point, to my, to my, to my, and that's how it finishes off, to my, to my, to my, but this sequence is broken in 159 to our English Terence, Mr Will Shake hyphen Spear, he's uh, dissociating him self from him in some way, saying our of our nation, which of course is not exactly how you read the epigram itself, and to his most constant, though most unknown friend, nobody. So one thing we can certainly glean from this is that epigram 160 deals with Shakespeare's most constant, though most unknown friend, nobody. And if we're going to understand what Davis of Hereford is saying about Shakespeare, we need to look carefully at 160 to his most constant, though most unknown friend, nobody. The obvious question to ask is, who then is nobody? As I've said, Davis of Hereford is helpful. He always gives you hints of how to understand his poems, and the help here comes from the very next poem, to my near, dear, well-known friend, somebody. Who is somebody in this epigram? Not too difficult to work out. You see that he says, I, 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 five times, myself, 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 three times. So somebody is himself, i.e. Davis of Hereford himself. You look that as myself I you should use. In other words, you look so much like me that I should use you of myself. I will, or else myself I should abuse. And yet with rhymes I but myself undo, yet am I somebody with much ado. A do meaning a relationship, interaction, connection, dealings, concerns. So there's a little joke going on there that Davis himself is calling himself somebody and his near, obviously very close, well-known, very well-known to him friend, somebody. So now let's, by correlation, apply this to the epigram above about Shakespeare's friend to his most constant, though most unknown friend, nobody. And the suggestion clearly is that that nobody is himself. Remember that Shakespeare is a concealed poet, that Shakespeare is a pseudonym. His most constant friend is someone who is by his side from the moment of his birth until his death, uh, although most unknown because he is a concealed playwright. You shall be served straight away the implication that he is more worthy of higher rank than Davis of Hereford. You shall be served, but not with numbers now. Numbers, of course, are verses. So in other words, Davis of Hereford is saying, I am not going to write verses in praise of you now. You shall be served with naught. That's good for you. Again, a catastrophe for the Stratfordian thesis. Why should William of Stratford want to be served with naught and have no verses praising him? Of course, if you're a concealed poet, that makes sense. Not only that, but in the very same year that Davis of Hereford published this poem, this book came out with inside it a very long poem by Davis of Hereford, so he certainly knew it, and it also had an old poem that had been addressed to the Earl of Oxford, to the right illustrious Earl of Oxford, you desire neither external wealth nor to be praised in poetry, therefore nothing is good for him. He doesn't need poetry to praise him, and that's exactly what is being said here. But of course that line has an even deeper meaning, and to understand that deeper meaning, who better to explain it to us than Davis of Hereford himself? Just four or five years before this poem was published, Davis of Hereford published another called Speculum Proditori, 
in which he wrote of a man who smiled to himself, i.e. something was good for him, and said, look here, I have for naught what kings do buy so dear. A clear reference to Edward de Vere's poem again, My mind to me a kingdom is. The section begins, I knew a man, unworthy as I am, in other words, this is a man of much higher social estate than Davis of Hereford. Uh, this man was too worthy for a counterfeit. In other words, he was not one who imitates another for whom he passes himself off. He was too worthy, too high to be an actor, made once a king, who though it were in game, does that ring a bell? We're looking at the Shakespeare phrase about Shakespeare who played some kingly parts in sport. So in the earlier poem, uh, this Edward de Vere figure made a king in game. So we're clearly talking about the same person that the later poem, the Shakespeare epigram, is in some way commenting upon da Davis of Hereford's earlier poem. And of course this completely torpedoes Professor Sir Stanley Wells' certainty that the Shakespeare epigram is about an actor. The word made in the earlier poem, he made once a king. Well, a maker is a poet. A playmaker is a composer or writer of plays, a dramatic author. So I think that puts it to bed once and for all, the question of whether we are talking about an actor or a writer. Yet was it there where lords and ladies met? Lords and ladies, as we know, meet at court. And in the Shakespeare epigram, if he hadn't played some kingly parts in sport, he would have been a companion for a king. So clearly it was at court that he caused this offence. So once again, we see that these two poems are definitively talking about the same person. The section ends, his reign was short and sweet. Theirs, that's to say, kings, monarchs, long in woe. He after lived, they with or for theirs die. He had a taste of reign with power to leave. Again, it is later commented on that he has no railing, he has no limit, he is free, but a reigning wit. So I think the point has been thoroughly made that Davis of Hereford had already covered this ground and that he is using the Shakespeare epigram to explain to the reader that Shakespeare is Edward de Vere. Now, in the few minutes I've got left, I hope you will bear with me as we take a very quick look at the epigram that precedes the one on Shakespeare, number 158, which is dedicated to my worthy kind friend, Master Isaac Simmons. Simmons is a non-entity, and that's quite odd because his epigram comes after one to Samuel Daniel, one to Ben Jonson, and one to Inigo Jones, all very famous people, and is followed by one to Shakespeare. It is my view that this, as I say, is dedicated to Isaac Simmons, but that the epigram itself is addressed to Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. We do have other examples of this technique. In fact, I've already put one online under the title Thomas Porter New. So let's imagine that this epigram is addressed to Edward de Vere and that we have three in a row talking about Edward de Vere, the central one, the inside, talking of de Vere as shake hyphen spear, the hidden playwright behind the pseudonym and the two outer ones talking about the hidden playwright who is nameless Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. That's why Epigram 158 begins, thine out and inside both seem such to me, as were I Arthur, thou my knight shouldst be, and at my table round shouldst have a place. So already you can see a slight tension here about social hierarchies. Where I Arthur is where I king, obviously, and rather brings to mind another famous poem by Edward de Vere, Were I a King. He goes on, were I a king, I might command content. Well, were I Arthur, thou my knight shouldst be, but he's talking about the round table, of course, which smothers that problem of social hierarchies. Even so, says Davis of Hereford, that is not actually possible. But Sith, that cannot be. This may and can. Play thou the king of hearts. I'll play thy man. This idea of playing the man, we saw it in the epigram 160, you shall be served. The idea is now he's going to retreat into the mind. Play thou the king of hearts. One can't help thinking that he is talking about the famous uh, tragedy of Richard, Duke of York, which we know better as Henry VI, part three by Shakespeare, but was uh, 
twice published in quarto by the time that Davis was writing his poem, particularly this little part of it where the king is in disguise in the forest and is found by a keeper who says, Aye, but thou talkest as if thou wert a king thyself. Why, so I am, in mind though, not in show. And if thou be king, where is thy crown? My crown is in my heart, he's king of hearts, of course, not on my head. My crown is called content, a crown that kings do seldom times enjoy. Great strong reminiscence there of Veer's poem, Were I a king, were I a king, I might command content. And of course his words, content I live, this is my stay, for what I lack my mind supplies. Lo, thus I triumph like a king, content with that my mind doth bring. I hope I haven't bombarded you with too many ideas, too many thoughts, too many poems, but the general message has come across loud and clear that Davis of Hereford, a poet very well connected to the court, knew perfectly well that Edward de Vere was the poet behind the pseudonym William Shake-Spear. Thank you very much indeed for watching and please keep in touch.